God so loved the girls have graciously agreed to lead us in the motions for the verse all right you want to actually let's show them real quick okay ready for God so loved the world that he gave us his one
Good morning. Welcome to Northwood Chapel. Hey, uh, those girls were mine. Yeah. And Jennifer's. She was, she was there. Yeah. And I have another one, too. I love her, too. Say, uh, to visitors, new folks, welcome. Thanks for coming. I want to share a little experience that I had this morning. This is the kind of guy that I am, okay? So, like, I'm focused or I'm on mission or something, and I don't... Well, so Wayne and Martha said, Hey, Jake, have you met Kevin? And I hadn't. And you know what I was going to do? I was just going to keep walking. I wasn't going to say hi. I didn't say hi. I wasn't thinking of saying hi. Uh, and it helped so much to be introduced. So if you have come with a friend to church, there's massive power in being able to say, hey, have you met? Like, it's just that easy, right? And it helps people like me, maybe you're like me, where I knew person. <laughs> and where does the conversation even begin, right? But we can help each other initiate the conversations. If you know somebody that's come in, or if you're just more adventurous even than me, you can say, hi, new person. <laughs> even though that's not their name, you could use it and see if they correct what the name is. Okay, so, uh, hey, isn't this groovy? I feel like... This is starting to become a thing, and maybe we'll have legs. It will endure. Yeah? The calendar. Look how many options you have to get involved with this congregation, be part of this community. Please join us. So, uh, Sunday mornings, we've got uh, adult Sunday school at 9, and then the service. Uh, Mondays, what days are those again? It's like first and third, second and fourth? Every Monday. Every Monday. Every Monday, the uh, young adults, and then, oh, it's the second and fourth Tuesdays, um, is what? Birch Bay Meets? Show up somewhere. <laughs> Every other Tuesday, 6 p.m. One thing I did want to push specifically is the new home group. Uh, Beginning April 17th, that's uh, Wednesday, first and third Wednesdays, uh, Jeremy and Jewel, uh, 6.30 p.m., are going to be leading a um, home group on a, with a video series called Emotionally Healthy Relationships. So I happen to have had experience with emotionally healthy spirituality from uh, Pastor Scazzaro out of the East Coast with Bible College. And that class, we had a whole term on emotionally healthy spirituality, was among the, the most favorite of all the students because it helps people apply the scripture to, how come I'm always bickering with such and such person? Why, why am I triggered in conversations with that other person out there? Why is my relationship with them fraught? And Peter Scazzaro has got a way of helping us grow emotionally. We can't be spiritually mature if we are not emotionally mature. And this class, uh, this home group, low pressure, I doubt that there's going to be like real deep confession of that one time way back when, when you did the thing. I don't think that's going to happen. But there will be a way to help kind of process or get some ideas of how to process uh, through some experiences for emotional and spiritual maturity. Okay. I'll stop there. Uh, Staff Holt visits. Uh, today we're doing one. And Wednesdays, April 24th is the next one. Men's Fishing Retreat, May 2nd to 5th in Conconelli. That's how you say that, right? Uh, ladies Bible Study just started Grace. Tuesdays, 9.15 a.m. Men's Bible Study, Fridays at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, the Birch Bay Bible Study, working through Micah. Uh, anything else? I miss it. We're so glad you're here. I pray that the Holy Spirit works through uh, music, through Todd, and that uh, you really feel welcome and loved and advance God's kingdom. Amen.
kids, how you doing? Are there any other kids that want to come up front? Anybody want to come on up and hear the children's message? Okay, you could come on up if you want. How are you, Antonio? <laughs> Good, all right. So the message today that Pastor Todd is going to give, and I'm going to give you a little message, is on John chapter 6, and it's verse 35. And here's what it says. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes on me shall never thirst. Do we have the picture? Ah, there we go. What do you think of when you see that picture? Antonio, what does that look like? What are, what are your feelings you get from that picture? Mountains. Mountains, yeah. Brody? Amalia? I have lots of here of nothing. <laughs> okay, very good. Lydia? Dry. Dry. Sophia? Dusty. Dusty. Yeah. Anybody else? Bumpy. Bumpy. Yes. Very much so. Yeah, I looked at that picture because, you know, Jesus referenced this when he um, said that I am the bread of life, and I'm going to tell you why. Yeah, it looks like it's really dry. There's no water. Doesn't look like anything grows there. I know something else about this land that you might remember there's lots of snakes and you know why i know that i don't see any up there but moses wrote about it in numbers 21 remember children of israel and the snakes there's lots of snakes up there maybe your parents and you could read about it sometime so exodus 16 tells us about god's people wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years that's the wilderness before they arrived to the promised land. God delivered his people from the Egyptian army. Um, they crossed the Red Sea. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Do you remember that? And he gave him fresh water at the bitter waters of Marah. And you know what? After all that, they complained. And they wandered around the wilderness for 40 years. So... They were wandering around. They were pretty hungry. I don't see much to eat there, do you? But you know what God did for them? God sent quail in the evening. What's a quail? Do you know? Go ahead, Avery. A bird. It's a bird. Yes, Avery knows lots about animals. Absolutely, it's a bird. And you know what? It was a bird, and they were going to eat it. It probably tastes like chicken. I'm sure quail tastes pretty good. It's probably like chicken. So, so that was in the evening. And in the morning, God sent manna. It was bread from heaven. They called it manna because they didn't know what it is. They didn't know. It was something new. Bread from heaven. Isn't God wonderful caring for them? I thought that's a really wonderful story. So here's the message. Like the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness of sin, so we are wandering in the wilderness. Without Jesus, we are separated from God because he is holy and we are sinful. But God, in his great love and mercy, sent his only son Jesus, who was without sin, to save us. Jesus willingly went to the cross to die, shedding his own perfect blood, rose again on the third day, and is in heaven with God. And by believing on him, we can be saved and brought back to God in heaven someday. Isn't that wonderful? So here's the problem with the quail and the manna. The problem with the quail and the manna in the wilderness during Moses' day is that it was only temporary. They ate it, had their fill, and the next day they were hungry again. Isn't that right? You've been without a meal for one day? Get hungry. So the Bible says in John 6... 32 to 35, it says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, 
But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which came down from heaven, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. You want to know something funny? They didn't know what manna was? My mom showed me this. Mark 6, 2, it says, Many hearing them were astonished at Jesus' teaching, and they said, Where'd this man come from that's saying these things? They didn't know who he was either. They didn't realize he was the Son of God. All right, let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for these children here and that you um, are watching over them. And we just ask, Lord, that you just put the seed in their hearts and let it grow and grow and grow And as they get closer to you. And just bless us today, bless our service, and bless these children. In Jesus' name, amen. I guess you guys can go up. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Todd. I'm the pastor here, and I have the a privilege of introducing Andy Mezinger and uh, uh, Rachel. And uh, I just, just met you guys, and I've talked to you a little bit on email, but we all know Natalie uh, and how much CEF has blessed our church and our children. And it's been a great ministry. Good News Club is, uh, is a Child Evangelism Fellowship. And we've been just tremendously blessed by your ministry, uh, and their ministry is CEF in Sri Lanka, and they have graciously come to share a little bit about what they do all the way on the other side of the world. So Andy, would you come and, and share a little bit about your ministry? And also, they have a table in the back with some really neat stuff, some coins and some uh, other information. I'm sure we can get on a mailing list if, if, uh, if we want to, and you'll tell us about that. All right, great. Thanks you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, it's always a, a pleasure to be here at Northwood. Northwood is actually very close to our hearts. For years and years, we served in the day camps here um, at the church. Um, I grew up in Yakima, Washington. I moved to Whatcom County to work with Child Evangelism Fellowship. And the very first Bible lesson I ever shared in Whatcom County was actually right here on this stage at the day camp. And so it's always exciting to come here and be able to, to speak from this very first stage where it all started for me in Whatcom County. Um, we served with Child Evangelism Fellowship for 10 years here in Whatcom County before the Lord put on our hearts to go and serve him overseas. Uh, we had a heavy burden on our hearts to reach people in the South Asia region of the world. That's up here on the screen. It's India and the surrounding region. When I was uh, pretty young, the Lord put it on my heart to be praying for India, praying for the boys and girls who live in India, praying for the people who live in South Asia, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and um, any country around India. And as we prayed over this countries and we prayed that people would be hearing the gospel, God put it on our hearts more and more to be reaching these people in some way, whether it's giving so the missions can happen, or short-term missions, or even going. And as we prayed about it, the burden was heavier and heavier on our, on our hearts because we knew that in this region of the world, very few people are hearing the gospel. Very few people are wanting to share the gospel. In a lot of these countries, less than 1% of the people know Christ, and even fewer of them want to share Christ with others. If you were a boy or girl, and you were growing up in Sri Lanka, the chances of you hearing about Jesus are very, very small. And we couldn't live with that burden on our hearts anymore. So we prayed about it. We contacted CEF. And through many, many open and closed doors, God made a way for us to go to Sri Lanka in 2019. And in 2019, we began to share the gospel with the boys and girls in Sri Lanka. The reason why we want to be there is, of course, this. Because the Lord... Jesus Christ said to his disciples, and not just to his disciples, but to all of his followers, this is the calling that we have. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. 
When I hear these words and I hear this calling, I have to think about the boys and girls who live in Sri Lanka. There are so many that are not hearing the gospel, so many that will never hear the gospel until someone goes and presents that message to them. In Sri Lanka, there's a lot of different religions. About 70% of the people are a Theravada Buddhist, and they are very far from Christ, very into worshiping idols, very into um, various religious practices that are very far from Christ. A lot of Hindus a lot of Hindu temples around us. The pictures that you see on the screen are either right next door to our church, the Buddhist statue, or right next to a partnering church is the Hindu temple. On the back side of our church, we have an Islamic mosque. Islam is growing in Sri Lanka faster than any other religion. They're very wealthy, very kind, very welcoming, and the Sri Lankan people love that. They're attracted to it, and Islam is growing. It's about 10% of the people are now Islamic. There's a very, very idol-worshipping form of Christianity that is in Sri Lanka. A lot of cult groups, a lot of groups that are very far from a biblical gospel uh, preaching church. Um, and all throughout Sri Lanka, the, the national sin is idols. There's idolatry everywhere. Everywhere you go in the country, you're going to see idols, see boys and girls bowing down to idols, see adults worshiping idols, giving flowers to the, to the, at the temples in the mornings. Um, they love their idols. But there are some Christian churches. About 1% of the people are an evangelical Christian. And of the 200 and 210,000 Christians that are in the country, there's only a, a small handful that actually want to share the gospel. When the first time I spoke at a church, they said, don't say the name Child Evangelism Fellowship. Do not share evangelism. It's a semi-persecuted country. People do not want to hear about evangelism. Converting to a new religion is just not okay. So don't share the name. They're very scared to go out and share the gospel. But we are there because we want to see the boys and girls of Sri Lanka reach with the gospel. Um, Child Evangelism Fellowship, everywhere we go, we do the same thing. We evangelize boys and girls, disciple them in the Bible, and then find a church for them to go to. So it's presenting Christ, telling him, that child in an open, clear, direct way that Jesus died on the cross for their sin, how they can come into relationship with him. Once they do, week after week, for an hour and a half, we'll be with these children, discipling them in the Bible, teaching them what God's word says, and then finding a church for them to go to. In Sri Lanka, it's difficult because there's not a lot of churches for them to go to. These are villages where there's a Hindu temple, there's a Buddhist temple, but not a Christian church. And so we partnered with a lot of different pastors to plant churches and villages and do things to make it so these boys and girls can go to church. And so it's a, it's a big work, but in the year of 2023, there were 52,000, you see the number on the screen, 52,000 boys and girls all across Sri Lanka that got to hear a face-to-face -face presentation of the gospel because of the work of Child Evangelism Fellowship in the country. So praise the Lord for what he's doing. Well, we reach them through five day clubs like we've had at the church here and day camps like we've had here at the church. Um, we do the same thing overseas. We do good news clubs like we have here at this church. Um, we do the same thing, hour and a half, same curriculum, just in their languages. They speak Tamil and Sinhala. Those are their languages. And so we've taken the same materials, translated them, and we're sharing um, the Good News Clubs and the day camps and five-day clubs, just like we do here, there, in their languages. And doing party clubs. Um, this is a camp that we did just before we left. We took 400 children from all over Sri Lanka and brought them to one camp presented the gospel, and day after day got to share with them the gospel. Um, we have 1,653 good news clubs that are ongoing in Sri Lanka. So just like the club here, just all over the country, thousands of volunteers have come saying they want to uh, share the gospel through a good news club. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the main reasons why we are doing this ministry because we get that question a lot. Why did you leave Whatcom County? The ministry is good in Whatcom County. Why did you leave it and go to Sri Lanka? And really, this is our reason. Because I, like Paul, I would say this too. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith. In, in who? In the Son of God who loved me. And he gave himself for me. And I had a friend recently ask, is there any verse in the Bible that actually says Jesus loves me? John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. But is there any verse that really says Jesus loves me? And I really think this is maybe the only one that directly says the Son of God who loved me 
and, and gave himself for me. And because he gave himself for us, we're going to share that message with the people in Sri Lanka. In 2019, when we came to Sri Lanka, there were eight staff in the country. And there were a few other staff that were serving in the office. Eleven of us all together. And we wanted to reach the, the, the hundreds of thousands of children that live in Sri Lanka with the gospel message. And we started to pray and we said, God... You've got to make a way for us to be able to share the gospel with all these children. There's no way that we can do it alone. So we began to pray for more staff. We thought maybe if there's one or two or maybe even three workers that can speak Singala and go out and reach children, that would be such a blessing. But when we came to Sri Lanka in 2019, just four or five months later, so did COVID. And COVID in Sri Lanka was a very extreme response. There were about nine months of the year where no one could leave their houses, not even to get food, nothing. It was a lockdown everywhere you went. There were police. It was a, um, it was a uh, police state. It was very difficult to live there, very difficult to work there. We began to think, Lord, we came here with a plan. We knew what we were going to do. What are you doing? Why did you bring us here at this time? We want another worker. We want two or three workers. But God had different plans. He directed our paths to going online, um, doing children's ministry through the, the camera equipment that I had brought to do other ministry. Um, he directed us to doing uh, children's ministry. Week after week, we had a, a program in English, a Good News Club program in Sinhala and in Tamil. And we went out and gave it to churches, gave it to pastors as they did church visits. People from all over the country were seeing it and thinking, I want that material for my church. I want that kind of ministry in my neighborhood. And after the COVID um, released and we were able to actually go out and do ministry, the staff started to receive people who wanted to volunteer, people who wanted to be working for Child Evangelism Fellowship. We did a discipleship program in 2020, uh, 2021, and out of that, our staff grew to 22 people. And with 22 people, which is abundantly more than we were praying for, we began to go out and reach the boys and girls, train adults on how to reach the boys and girls all over Sri Lanka. In 2023, we had another uh, discipleship program, three months of kind of like, um, kind of like a, a Bible college classes on how to do children's ministry. And for three months, we had them come get the training, and become staff. And right now in Sri Lanka, there are 34 national workers all out in different areas reaching boys and girls with the gospel, training volunteers to also reach boys and girls with the gospel. We were praying for one or two, but clearly God can do above and beyond what we could possibly imagine him doing. And so we do have a few prayer requests before I'm done. We have several things that I'd like you to pray for, but there's pray for, but there's two things specifically that I would like you to pray for. Um, and if you would like to partner with us in ministry, prayer is the main need that we have. We need an army of people behind us praying that the boys and girls would be evangelized and be discipled and we'd find churches for them. Sri Lanka is a difficult country. Um, it's difficult in culture, in language, the uh, climate. It's a difficult place to do ministry. So please pray for us. And if you would like to give towards the ministry, um, please come and talk to me. We are looking for people that can give monthly to have this ministry continue in Sri Lanka. There are 34 staff that work for CEF. They get paid um, a very good wage in Sri Lanka. It's about $150 to $200. If you'd like to give towards them, 100% of the money given towards those staff goes to those staff. No administration fees. It's a wonderful way to reach and really maximize the reach of that uh, financial gift. Um, but there are some, some needs. The first thing is, please pray. We want to have a building to do this training that we did in Sri Lanka that grew the ministry so much, we would like to offer that to all of the Middle East. There are many different countries who it's very difficult to go into, bring international people to do these trainings, but anyone can come to Sri Lanka. Anyone in the Middle East can get a visa to Sri Lanka. And if they can come, they can get training, do the 90 days on a 90-day visa, and then go back to key countries all over the Middle East and continue the ministry of reaching boys and girls even in their home countries in the Middle East. So please, Pray for this building, for the wisdom behind having a building, finding a building, maintaining the building, and also the finances to come into. We need about $500,000 to buy a hotel with 40 rooms and a wedding hall, which seems like nothing um, compared to what it would be here, um, but for there, it's a lot of money. And so we, we, we're just praying that the Lord would provide for that too. Um, this is a map of what Sri Lanka looked like in 2019. The red areas, no ministry. Um, from Child Evangelism Fellowship. The yellow areas, there was no ministry, but there were people that were, were training to do ministry there. The green areas were the only places where Child Evangelism Fellowship was reaching boys and girls with the gospel. And then 
in spite of COVID, maybe even because of COVID, God opened the doors to allowing so much more of the country to be open. And when you see the map now, you might think, well, there's some areas that you're still not sharing. Those areas have very few people living. It's a mountainous place. There's some plains where there's very few people. There's still boys and girls there, though. So we're praying that God would open up these eight areas that we still need open. When we came to the country, there were eight areas open, 17 closed. And right now, there's 17 open and eight areas that are closed. There are districts in the country. So please pray that God would continue to grow his ministry. Boys and girls would continue to hear the gospel. And please be praying for the Meinzingers too as we share the gospel in Sri Lanka. I want to share this verse before I'm done. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, for the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, for their sake, died and was raised. This is why we do what we do. We are compelled by the love of Christ because we've concluded the same thing. Christ has died for all. And if that's true, we're not going to be living for ourselves. We want to live that the boys and girls get to hear the gospel. Please be praying for us. We have a, a Sri Lankan coin, the coins on the back table. Please take one. Put it somewhere in your house where you can pray for Sri Lanka. And please be taking one of our prayer cards as you go to so you can pray for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay, uh, please stay. I'll pray. I'd like to pray for you. Yeah. 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 I, won't, I won't bite. Okay. So, um, th here's a gift from our church to you guys. And also, if you want to uh, support them, uh, you can find out more at the table after the service. All right. So it's amazing. That, that map was amazing to see what God is doing there. And the pictures, the growing number of them. You were very easy to spot in those pictures. Yeah. Which, yeah, uh, which is great. And uh, I'm just amazed at what God's doing. So let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for Andy and Rachel and their response to your call to Sri Lanka. And uh, I pray you would continue this ministry. Uh, we are amazed how you work in spite of the challenges. And actually, um, because of those challenges, uh, you make us step out of our comfort zone and reach places that we wouldn't normally have reached. And we see that with the challenge of COVID in Sri Lanka. We pray, Lord, for the buildings. We pray for the staff. We pray for training. Uh, we pray that you would call others to this amazing ministry and more and more children in Sri Lanka would come to know you and receive the saving grace of knowing you as the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world, who came to take away their sins and save them for eternal life. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Your scripture reading today is John 6, verses 30 through 40. So then they asked him, what miraculous sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. All right, and we...
Thank you, John. Uh, we saw the, the man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda, and this is all connected, where he comes and he saves, um, he asks him, do you want to get well? Do you want to be well? It's the question we are asking ourselves throughout this series is, do you want to get well? Do I want to get well? Well, first of all, you need to know that you need to get well, that there's something wrong. Who, me? Something wrong? I'm offended, Right? But if we're honest with ourselves, we search our own hearts, we know that there is something wrong that needs to be repaired, that needs to be fixed, and we can't do it on our own. The only one that can do that is Jesus Christ. And and through that experience, we have the naysayers, the people that witnessed that, and they saw this amazing thing happen. They didn't deny that that thing happened, but what did they do? They found something wrong with what he did. You didn't do it. You did it on the Sabbath. Well... They miss the point. And so often we miss the point. We went on from there that believing there's a reasonable faith that he has given these people that have witnessed Jesus walking in Galilee, in Judea, and have performed these miracles and have taught with authority. He has given them much reason to believe, and we have been given much reason to believe. God provides us with the testimony of others. Jesus backed his words with works. God testifies to the validity of Jesus, and Scripture testifies to the validity of Jesus. There is much credibility to the ancient scripts that have been found of the Bible more than any other ancient script, and it is very, very credible, more credible than any other ancient document in all time. So last week we saw the disciples, after he feeds the 5,000, go out into the water, on the boat, the storm starts, one of the most popular stories in in the Bible, and the storm is going, and Jesus walks on water. And when he's walking on water, the disciples see that he's walking on water, they are terrified, as you would be too, but there is this step of faith, to say, and he says, it is I, or I am. You recognize his voice, and Brothers and sisters, it's about relationship. Don't think that religion is just some sort of thing that you do, something you walk through, something you're disconnected with, something you have to do because you're told to do it. It is about relationship. Do you recognize Jesus' voice? And when you recognize Jesus' voice, you recognize who he is, that he loves you, that he is all-powerful, all-knowing, he is an ever-present God over all, through all, and in all, yet he loves us and cares for us. He is not a disconnected God. He desires relationship with us, and that is what he has provided through Jesus. Amen? And so here we see, as they invited Jesus into the boat, or like Peter, who went out to him, and the storm was calmed. So we are called to this step of faith. Now, here we, we get into the passage for the day that says, so they asked him. Now, here the disciples have gone out in the boat. Jesus walks out, and he's in the boat. Now they go all the way to Capernaum, and now they're in Capernaum. And the people, the 5,000 that were over that got fed miraculously from the loaves and the fishes, they're searching for him. They find him. I don't know if they took a boat or if they went around. That's a long way to go, but they're searching for Jesus. And credit to them that they have gone all that way looking for the answer. They find him and they ask him, what sign then will you give me that uh, give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Now, Now remember, like when we're talking about faith and proof, right? The, the science community, uh, the, uh, the secular community will, will charge Christianity with this and say, you don't have any proof. Show me more proof. More, more, more proof. And there is never enough proof. When God has given us many reasons to believe and he has given us much credibility, he has given us nature to see, and there is plenty of reason to believe. But what these people... These people have just been fed miraculously, 5,000 people fed, and they're going, what sign are you going to give me? (laughs) Didn't he just give them a sign? Yes, but their eyes are closed. They just want more, but God is saying, I've given you plenty of reason to believe. Now it's your turn. Step out of the boat. And 
And he says our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So he actually goes, didn't I just feed you? He didn't say that. He went all the way back to the, the core things that, that the, the people believed because they were Jewish people. They believed in Moses and the stories of Moses from Exodus and how God led them out of Egypt through the wilderness, through the desert. And in the desert, they were starving and they provided, he provided manna. And that manna was to be eaten on that day, not collect anymore because God was going to provide manna for the next day and the next day and the next day. And that was the miracle of providing this bread similar to what Jesus did in, in feeding the 5,000. It's like the same sign. It's the same miracle. How many times do I need to feed you before you're going to believe? And at some point, he has to say, no, it's your turn. You step out in faith. Because faith is what saves. It's an important, very important core value, core teaching of Jesus. Believe by faith. And it's different than any other religion. All other religions say you have to earn your way. You have to do things to earn God's pleasure or God's grace or your way to heaven. No, you fall short. You've got to be honest with yourself, man. You will fall short. It's about faith. So, here the people are testing Jesus, right? But they are referring to a passage where God is testing them. This is often the case in God's relationship with man, testing to strengthen and challenge us. You know, God does that. He tests us to strengthen us and to challenge us. That makes Christianity pretty exciting, by the way. And it's kind of like Gideon. Now, you saw the story of Gideon. Uh, in Judges 3, 36 through 38, it says, So Gideon said, If you will save Israel by my hand, and you have said, Look, I, like you have said, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it says, And it was so. You know, and it was so. You translate that. Amen. <laughs> so be it. So be it. What God asked the Israelites was to trust and obey. What God asked Gideon to do was to trust and obey, and God would use him in a mighty way. God calls Gideon while he's on the threshing floor, by the way. He's scared of the Amalekites, and, and he goes and he hides in the threshing floor. And so this is the great man of valor as this angel comes and he confronts Gideon and he says, oh, you great man of valor, which is pretty darn funny because he's hiding out in the threshing floor, all right? And when he's hiding out there, the angel comes to him and he tells him he is going to use him to defeat the Midianites. Gideon prays then and sacrifices. The angel sets fire to the offering. Gideon destroys Joash's Baal altars and Asherah poles. By the way, talk about courage and stepping out in faith because Joash is his dad. All right, so, so it's kind of like how, do you, how you go up against a family member when they're doing something that's not right. That's really hard, right? I don't know if you're ready to do that. It's hard. But here, Gideon prays and sacrifices. So this is very different than what the, uh, the, the people have come, and they've come to Jesus, and they say, show me a sign, show me another sign, show me another sign. And Gideon is coming, and he's confronted, and he's challenged, and he's tested, and he, what does he do? He prays about it. He sacrifices. He goes through the right channels to reflect and pray and look for guidance. And it's affirmed. And he takes the next step forward. See, this is different. It's not wrong to test God. It's wrong to test God in certain ways. And we're going to look at that. So Gideon destroys the altar and the Asherah poles. And Gideon asks God for a sign. Fleece and dew. So the first is dew on the, <laughs> dew on the fleece, dry on the ground. I had to write this down because I'm dyslexic. I get it all wrong. Second, dry on the fleece and dew on the ground. Then God tests Gideon. So it goes back and forth. God tests Gideon. 
He's got 20,000 soldiers. Now, if you're a commander, I've never seen this in history. If you read history or read anything about this, have you read, ever read about a commander who comes to his people and says, you know what? We're going into battle. It's going to be rough. People are going to die. If any of you are scared, go home. It's okay. Right? So, so he does this, and now there's 10,000. And then he, God says, okay, go to the creek. And then anyone who gets down on his knees and puts his head down and drinks the water, they go home too. And so Gideon's like hoping they, like, you know, none of them do it. The ones that cup, the, cup it and they, they drink it, which is kind of funny because they lapped it like a dog. <laughs> no, it's just a funny image, right? Only 300 of them did it that way. So all of a sudden we go from 20,000 to 10,000 to 300. And then God says, all right, these are your guys. Let's go into battle. And he instructs them what to do. And you can read the rest of the story. I'm not going to give you all of it. Uh, but he, he takes uh, the fire in the pots and he goes in the evening and they crack them and they make a lot of noise. And then the Amalekites wind up killing themselves. Victory, and they didn't even go into battle. That is amazing. But God tested Gideon. Gideon tested God. God tested Gideon. But it was in the context of this relationship of trust. Wanting to trust and then taking that step forward in trust. So here's asking Jesus questions. Is number one, when you ask Jesus questions, when you pray and ask him, ask honest questions. Don't, don't beat around the bush. Go ahead and be honest with him. In Judges 6.13, it says, Oh, my Lord, Gideon says, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. This is an honest ask. Right? A very honest ask. And by the way, you might have some very honest asks to ask Jesus. Right? You see what's going on in the world. You see the news. You see all of that stuff going on. You may have some honest asks to ask Jesus. But the important thing is, and that's my next point, is that you ask. It's okay to ask. He is not offended. He has heard it before. He's not going to be surprised. But the important thing here is that you are in a relationship with Jesus, that you're asking those honest questions, that you're having this dialogue and looking to Scripture for those answers. You know, Psalm 77, 7 through 9, by the way, if you remember, like some of the real honest prayers that David gives, they're found in Psalm 55, 66, 77, and 88, <laughs> But in here in Psalm 77, 7 through 9, it says, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promises failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in his anger withheld his compassion? And we might say something like today, is he, are you ever, did you forget to come back? No. He didn't forget to come back. He has fulfilled and had victory over the cross, from the cross and the resurrection, and more people are out there to be saved. And so we go and we do our part, and we trust and obey Jesus, and he will deliver. Amen? The third one is a don't. So ask, ask, don't ask for what he's already given you. You know, it's, it's like somebody gives you a car, and you go and ask for another car, Right? despite them asking for a sign that he, they had all, he had already provided with the manna, Jesus answers them. And it's still, God still responds, by the way. And, and I think in prayer, don't be afraid of prayer. You can't pray wrong. It's important that you're just praying, all right? God, are you out there? That's perfectly fine. But he answers. He sees through our shortcomings through the Holy Spirit. Like Romans 6, 26 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. He is 
Here is how Jesus responds. Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Oh, he's talking about, he's not talking about physical bread here, is he? He's talking about much more. And here's a big challenge. So they have tested Jesus. They have asked him about this. Now God is testing them and he is challenging them here. And he's revealing to them and sharing with them, hey, it's not about the healing. It's not just about the, the physical bread. There's something more. There's something more important that I'm here for. And it's the, I have come to bring eternal bread. Bread that you will never hunger for again. Thirst where you, uh, water where you will never thirst again. Similar to what Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, right? Everyone who drinks this water will will be thirsty again, Jesus said, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And he responds is the same as give us this bread. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water they said give us the bread she said give us the water give me the water jesus is offering her something better than water jesus is offering these people something better than bread jesus is the bread of life and jesus is the water that satisfies the thirsty forever that's eternal salvation God also is offering Gideon something greater than making bread as he hides in the threshing floor, trusting God as God uses him to save people. A key part of Jesus being the bread of life is that it sustains when consumed daily. Let's go back to the story of manna. They had to take the manna when? Daily. The Israelites ate manna the story of people, uh, the story the people are referring to, they had to gather it daily because like any food, you burn it off as energy and then you need more. You need it daily. You need Jesus daily. But the good news is he always provides. It's always there. Look at how Jesus taught us to pray here. Let's say that together. Give us today our daily bread. Pretty simple. Now here in 36 through 38 says, But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me, uh, Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. As Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 12, 39, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Talking about Jonah and the fish of three days and came out. He's talking about himself going into the grave three days and rising again. So when we pray, can we ask for a sign? When you ask, if you ask, ask like Gideon. Ask honest questions, but ask. Be in that relationship with him. And don't ask for what he's already given. Remember, he has already given us the ultimate sign. He came down from heaven, born of a virgin, lived without sin, died to save us, and rose on the third day. That's the sign of Jonah that he's talking about. And like Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, the Son of Man will be in the grave for three days and rise again. Do you believe that? That belief, that step of faith, that reasonable step of faith is what saves us. Now, don't ask him to do it again, though. Don't ask for more signs. He has given us the greatest sign of all. Trust and follow him in that. In Roman, uh, John 6, 39 through 40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those who have given me, but raise them up in the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Again, we have a reference to God's deliverance in the wilderness. The people did not listen and come to Moses and ask a question. This is not how to ask questions to God, accusingly. In Numbers 21.5, we have 
Uh, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? That's a loaded question, isn't it? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Well, God allows the snakes to come and they are beginning to die of poison. And then they pray for God to save them. Then the Lord tells Moses to make a pole with bronze snakes in verse 8 and 9. It's why you see, sometimes you see the ambulances and things like that with the pole with the snakes on it. That's where that comes from. Jesus says uh, to Moses, make a snake out of and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake, he looked at the bronze snake and they lived. Jesus says, I am what you look to for salvation. Of course, they didn't know he was also referring to the cross at that point. Look to the cross. Look to Jesus and his sacrifice for your sins and be saved. But this is the hard teaching. You might be hearing that and say, that is crazy. That is way out there. I don't believe it because it's just too nuts. But this is a hard teaching. So much so, at this point in the story, many disciples deserted Jesus. They walked away. And so many people today have walked away from Christianity. But that doesn't mean it's false. In fact, it's just following along the lines of what Jesus says happens. Why? Well, it wasn't what they expected. It wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't the sign they wanted. There will never be enough proof about Jesus that will be enough if what he has already done is not enough for you. There will never be enough proof about Jesus that will be enough if what he has already done is not enough for you. In John 6, 66, that's an unfortunate verse uh, number there, but... Uh, for this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. In John 6, 67 through 69 then, Jesus replies to that statement. You do not want to uh, leave too, do you? Talking to the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. There is no better option out there. Are you going to be like the twelve or the ones that desert? James 1.12 talks about perseverance. And this is such an important thing to know and learn as believers in this time, in this age, when our faith is being challenged so much. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You know, going back to Gideon, I'd like to close with an often forgotten part of the story. It's a dream an anonymous man tells Gideon after God had reduced his army from 20,000 to 300. It says... And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Ever heard the phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back? <laughs> this is the bread that broke the Midian camp. But like many prophecies... It's layered. And there's also a barley bread that rolled into town in Jerusalem. And that's Jesus. It's not the display of power of the bread. It's the precise application of the power that caused the tent to collapse. And although Jesus had the power that he could display to crush the enemy, he defeated the enemy as the bread of life. Precisely applied or broken, should I say, for us that brought evil down. 
That is the sign given. It's now up to you to believe or not, to stay or desert. But victory is in store for those who stay, and there is satisfaction for those who seek Him, the bread of life. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be what? Satisfied or filled. And Jesus taught us how to pray in that same passage. So let's say it together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, may this be our prayer. And like the woman at the well and like these people, give us this bread. Give us this water. But Lord, may we be open to receiving it the way you want us to, by faith. And enter into a relationship with you that is honest, that's open. And that as we ask these questions we would give you the tough questions and give them into your hands and, and, and cast away our worries and realize and see that you are over all, through all, and in all, that you are victorious. And in this world, there is many things that we don't understand, but Lord, we know because you have revealed it to us in our heart, in your word, and in creation that you are over all, through all, and in all, and you are victorious. And you will come back and set things right. And we will receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, the bread of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just this, he
as we go about our week, God, that everything we do is to give honor and glory to you. We love you, and it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great day.